Okay, welcome class to statistics. I am Professor Ray Ross. This semester we're going to be doing 14 weeks of lessons, mostly videos. And uh, the great thing about videos is you can always stop and rewind and you can review the lessons as you go. Uh, just before we start uh, lesson number one, just a couple little background things on the course itself. Uh, the online, this online website is going to contain a few things. It's going to contain my email, so you can contact me at any time. I also check my emails at night, I check them on the weekends, and I probably check them <laughs> between 20 and 30 times a day. I'm a little anal about emails, but that's a good thing. So please make sure that you can email me and ask me any questions at any time. Also on the website, uh, you'll notice the course grading policy. There is a homework PDF file link for the homework for the whole semester. There is the textbook information, uh, also each, each week's lessons, uh, which are usually a video. And then we also have some links to statistical tables we're going to need uh, during the semester. There's links for the exams for this course, and also a little information about each exam. And uh, also there's a link for my expectations for the course. And I want to make sure that you feel that this course is being taught in a very nice, straightforward manner. And if you ever have any questions at any time, please email me immediately and I will respond to you uh, definitely that day unless it's late at night I'm sleeping then I'll email you the next morning uh, but here we go alright so the course is basically set up in terms of videos and uh, I'm gonna try and do my best to explain this is like you'd be taking in the course in um, just a regular college setting you're sitting in the classroom you're watching me teach uh, the only difference is now I'm just gonna do the lecture as if you know, you're just watching from the classroom, but you can watch from your comfort of, of your home or wherever you're sitting. All right, here we go. All right, so the first lesson, here we go. Lesson number one, uh, we're going to be talking on this lesson about descriptive statistics, specifically frequency distributions, histograms, and polygons. And we have a number of examples we're going to do later. Uh, the only thing you really need for this lesson is a TI-83 calculator that's required for the course. And uh, here we go. So basically, statistics in general is the collection of data, after you collect data, then you go about organizing data. And sometimes you stop, and sometimes you go on. And if you stop organizing data, the data is in a nice, very pretty form that people can read easily. If you want to go on further, and you can use sometimes organized data to make future predictions. Uh, the collection of data here, this is the collection of data is not done this semester. So this is not done in an intro stats class. That's actually harder than you would think. The collection of data is very difficult. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Uh, the organization of data, organizing data, um, that's where you want to have things look pretty. We're going to do that actually today. Um, there are This organization of data is really under the guideline of, this is called descriptive statistics. And descriptive statistics is basically describing data. or putting data into easy to read tables and charts. Hope you can read my handwriting. The further, when you go to make predictions, the keyword in there is predictions. When you go to make predictions, then this goes into something called inferential statistics and in the word inferential is the word infer and that means to guess so that means making future predictions you're trying to guess at what will happen in the future a basic example of that would be in a course where you're taking a course for the first time it could be any course sociology psychology statistics and uh, biology chemistry and you want to know how this teacher grades and a good idea would be like the teacher on the first day actually said this is the percentage of A's and B's and C's and then the prediction the assumption would be then that is the general outcome of this semester's course that's not always the case but let's say you know one teacher has 35 percent A's and 25 percent B's and 30 percent C's and etc 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 then the assumption would be that's also what's going to happen this semester. But that's not necessarily true. But then again, that's making the future prediction. So the descriptive part would be just the showing of that. Then the inferential part would be the prediction that that would be what's going to happen this semester. 
All right, so let's go a little further. Here we go. Uh, some of the charts we're going to do this lesson um, in the descriptive part. So this lesson is just on descriptive statistics. We're not going to do inferential statistics. We're going to do a group data table. That's also sometimes called a frequency distribution table. We're going to do histograms, which are sometimes called bar graphs. Histograms, you know, kind of look like this, kind of like skyscrapers. Those are histograms or bar graphs. Uh, polygons are line graphs. So polygons usually look like something like this. All right, line graphs as you go. And uh, some of the charts we're not going to do this semester would be pie charts. Everybody knows what a pie chart looks like. And we're not going to do that. Uh, stem and leafs, you may not know what a stem and leaf is, but we're not going to do it anyway. So uh, these two things, um, the reason why we don't do them is, is just because you can get them. All of these you can get, but these particular you can get in like an Excel program or something like that. All right, so here we go. We're going to start right off. Uh, raw data. The definition of raw data is recently collected, unedited, and unorganized data. So that would be data that you get from usually what they call in statistics a sample. And a sample is a subset, subset of a population. Now let's talk about sample and populations. A population, don't think just like everybody in the United States. A population is everybody, but it could be everybody in a college or everybody in a classroom or everybody in New York State, everybody in the capital region of Minnesota or everybody in the United States. Or a population could also be a subset. It could be like all men ages 18 to 34 or all women aged 50 to 65, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A sample would be then obviously a subset. The way this is done in the real world, uh, samples are done typically by phone, and it's usually done using what they call a uh, RDD, a random digit dialer, RDD. So that's the one, you know, you're sitting home, you get a phone call, and you hear this computer voice on the phone and the reason why they're calling your house is because your number happened to be uh, randomly selected so what they'll do throughout the United States is they will go through every area code so in the capital region of New York the area codes 518 and they'll pick some random phone numbers in the 518 area code and they'll just call them up and if uh, they'll say you know could do you have five or few minutes to answer some questions and if you can answer some questions, then you do. And if you hang up the phone on them, then they just randomly pick up another phone number. So they'll say randomly. So the computer will just simply say, you know, spit out some numbers. So like seven, and then an eight, and then a three, and then a four, and then a one, and then a one, and then a zero. And they'll call the number. And they'll do that within the 518 area code. Then they'll do it like within the 315 area code, which is like the Utica area. And then they'll, you know, just randomly like 716 is the Buffalo area and they'll just randomly pick um, phone numbers within those area codes and they'll do it throughout the entire United States. They never do Hawaii and they never call Alaska. So it's always the 48 continental states that they always do random digit dialers. That's typically how things are done. There, there are other ones. Um, sometimes you can go to a mall and people have uh, people are standing there in a the hallway and they're asking people randomly about some questions but um, that's on a small scale. So anything that you see typically in the news is always done that way. So that's what they know as a uh, random digit dialer. The key for doing sampling, the key word that I'm going to use all semester long is the sample must be conducted when you're doing a sample. The sample must be conducted so the people are chosen randomly. That's the key. Um, you don't go in a setting and you call people on the phone and you realize that you had six women in a row that answer the phone. So then this, the seventh phone number, a woman answers the phone and you say, gee, I already have six women. I really don't want a seventh woman. So you don't, you know, continue with the conversation. That's what they call bias in a sample. You're not allowed to have any bias. You cannot put yourself into the situation where you're making selections. It all has to be done completely randomly. And uh, randomly, like I said, is done by computer, typically random digit dialer calling people on the phone. Uh, in another setting, randomly would be like uh, if you wanted to sample students at your college. Uh, a sociology professor wants you to do research, let's say, or a psychology professor wants you to do a research paper. And they ask you to do a sample of people in the college, other students. You have to do that randomly. You can't just go to your English class and say, hey, everybody in my English class, please fill out this, 
you know, sample questionnaire for you. That not everybody takes English at the college. Not everybody's in your English class. You have to make sure that everybody is selected randomly. Perfect way to do it. Get a list of everybody at the college, which is near impossible for a student and pick every 20th name on the list. Or you can just go where a lot of students congregate. Ask every fifth student that walks by. If one says no, ask the next one. And then when the next one says yes and they answer your questions, then ask the fifth one after that, or sixth one, or seventh one, or twelfth one. Just pick a number off the top of your head. Um, another way you can do it um, is by way of um, going to the registrar's office and asking them for just a bunch of uh, randomly selected student names and phone numbers. Typically they don't let you do that, but uh, maybe a faculty person could help you with that. But again, it has to be done randomly. Everybody has to have an equal chance of being picked. If you do go to the common area of a, of a college, you have to make sure that you go different days because not everybody may be there on a Monday when you're there or a Tuesday when you're there. So again, you have to keep everything random as much as possible. All right, so let's do some questions. That's just a general overview of, of descriptive statistics. So here we go. Uh, for number one, we're going to create a four-columned group data table, and we're going to start our first class with 10 using increments of 10. Now, class is another way of saying uh, class width. Um, now, class is, is, is basically your intervals for the question. So they want you to start. So we're going to do four columns. Here we go. So the first column is always simply called your general category column. You can label it if you want, like in this particular case, it's going to be random ages. And what they're doing is they want to start our first class with 10. So in starting with 10, so we're just going to start with 10. Now the, the problem we have to worry about is make sure that you get the increments right. So we want to go up increments of 10. If you go 10 and then you add 10 to 10 and get 20, that's actually going to be wrong because if you count on your fingers the numbers between 10 and 20, you're not getting 10, you're actually getting 11. Um, so what we want to do is the easiest way to do this is always make sure that whatever the increment is in the question, that is going to be the difference between the starting intervals as you go down. So if I want to have an increment of 10, I add that increment of 10 to 10, that gives me 20, and then I add 10 again, that gets me to 30, then I add 10 again, and that gets me to 40. And you keep on going until the data, so I have a 56 and I have a 74, so I want to make sure that I have a 50 and a 60, and I think I'm going to be good when I stop at 70, because the highest that we go notice on the top is 74 right there. So now if I go backwards, if this one starts at 10, okay, so these are called class widths. Um, or, class, or basically just first classes. So this is your first class, second class, third class, fourth class, fifth class, sixth class, seventh class on the way down. Now we have to end this. If this starts with 10, the next one starts with 20, then that means this one's going to go to 19. And again, 20, this one's going to go to 29 because it goes to 30, so this is going to be 39 and etc. And then what you notice is the increment is also 10s on the end. So we have increments of 10 in the beginning and increments of 10 on the end. So the difference between 10 and 20 and 30 is 10s, and 19 and 29 and 39 is also 10s. The second column is called the frequency column, which is denoted usually a little f for frequency. This is just tally marks, so we want to tally up uh, how many pieces of data in here are within the 10 and 19. So I'm just going to go across, and you'll notice we have an 18, we have a 13, and so that's going to be 2. And how many are in the 20 to 29 range? So we go across, there's a 27, 1, and there's only 1. And we have a 36, 1, 32 is 2, 34 is 3, 3 in the 30s. How many in the 40s? 1, 2, 3 in the 40s. And we have 2 in the 50s. Nobody's in the 60s, so 0. And then we have 174, so we're going to have 1. Now already you can notice that if I were to say to somebody what is the average age or something along those lines or just talk about age in general, how many people in the 20s and 30s and 40s, if I leave the data like this, raw, it's difficult to get an answer to those questions. How many people are in their 20s? How many people are in their 30s? It's tough because then you just got to count them up. If we do it for them and we just show this to them, it's a very nice descriptive statistical beginning of a chart. People understand, oh, okay, 10 to 19, there's 2, 20 to 29, there's 3. And you kind of get an idea of where people in this particular age distribution land. It's kind of nice. The third column is the relative frequency column. And of course that would then go RF. 
There's uh, three ways to do this. You can either use a fraction, and if you divide a fraction, that gets you a decimal, and you can turn the decimal into a percent. As far as I'm concerned, I, I just leave them fractions, but if you, if you notice the total down here, um, the total, if we had two, and that gives you three, six, nine, eleven, twelve. So the total is twelve students, which matches the number of data up here. So this would be two out of twelve, one out of twelve, three out of twelve, and three out of twelve, twelve out of twelve, zero out of twelve, and one out of twelve. So that would be the fractions. If you wanted to go further, and you know, if you had your calculator out, <clears throat> if we put in our calculators, and I'm going to show you right. If we put in our calculators, two divided by twelve. We get back 0.1666. Now, I always round two decimals all semester long for all the stuff just for consistency. So I'm going to say 0.16, the third six rounds that up to a seven. So we could say that that is 0.17, and we can then say that that's 17%. People definitely think in terms of percentage um, because it just makes sense, like whether we think, in, uh, you know, today there's a 20% chance of rain. Everybody knows what 20% means. When you use probabilities, like there's a 0.20 chance of rain, people just are comfortable with that. If we said 1 out of 12, then we go 1 divided by 12, whoop, 1 divided by 12, 0 0.033, so we're going to say 0 0.08, which would be 8%, and of course that would follow just like that. Okay, again, I'm, I'm happy with just the fractions. If you want to go further, that's fine. Other textbooks may go further, but fractions are fine. The relative frequency is a little bit better than the frequency because it tells you how many people you sampled. So two, not just two is good, but then two out of 12 is better because it tells you it's out of 12. And if you can reduce, don't. Only in algebra do you reduce. In statistics, don't reduce this two out of 12 to one over six because that would represent one person out of six, but that's really not what took place. It's really two out of 12. Here, three out of 12. Please don't reduce that to one out of four. One out of four is different. You didn't sample four people, you sampled 12 people, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the last column is called the class midpoint column. The class midpoint is the middle of each class, and we're going to be using that in another lesson, so it's nice to have it now. So 10 to 19, what is the middle value between 10 and 19? If you know right off the top of your head, that's great. If you don't, then the easy way to do it is take the lower number, which is 10 of the class, add the higher number, which is 19 of the class, and divide by 2. 10 and 19 gives you 29. 29 divided by 2 gives you 14 and a half. And you do that all the way down. So for the second class, you would say the low of the class interval is 20. You add the higher 29, divide by 2. That gives me 49 over 2. That's 24 and a half. And we're going to keep the half. You'll notice that the increment is also 10. If the first divide differ by 10, the seconds differ by 10, the middles differ by 10. So if you can do the formula all the way down, or you can just then basically just simply say the middle of 30 to 39 is 34 and a half, and then 44 and a half, 54 and a half, 64 and a half, and keep adding 10, you get 74 and a half. That would be the class midpoint. So there's your four column group data table. What we're going to do is we're going to do a bunch of examples um, from here. And what I'm going to do as far as the, the video is concerned is I'm going to show you the question, then I'm going to actually do the answer. If you want to do the question first, like for example, here's number two. Here's a different set of numbers. And for this one, we're sampling uh, some local hourly wages. And we have some hourly wages, $12.50, $16.40, $11.70, et cetera. And we want to create a four-columned grouped data table, and we want to start the first class with eight, and we want to use increments of two. And this would be exactly the way it's worded on a test. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to do this problem first, see if you can do it and then come back. You know, stop the video, come back and see if your answer is right. I apologize for the smudge, uh, but I'm going to do it for you. Okay, so we want to start our first class with eight. All right, so here's our four, here's our four columns. The first column is called the category column. Uh, if we wanted to call this local hourly wages, that's fine, or just leave it category. We have a frequency column, we have a relative frequency column, we have a class midpoint column. Okay, so <clears throat> this tells us how to create the interval. So we're going to start with 8, so I'm going to go over here, we're going to start our first one with 8, and we want to go up in increments of 2. So in going up in increments of 2, um, you're going to add 2 to 8, 
and that's going to give you back 8 plus 2 is 10 and then add 2 to that is 12 and then add 2 to that is 14 and we're going to go up as high as we need and if you look up here uh, let's see the highest looks like to be $21.75 nope I'm sorry $22.60 so the highest is $22.60 so we better make sure that we get $22.60 in an interval so we're gonna have to go down a little bit so 16 18 20 22 that should do us okay and if this starts with 8 then this one ends with 9 and this one 11 and that of course also differs by 2 so this would be 13 and 15 and 17 and 19 and 21 and 23 all right so we need 8 to 9 so uh, this is a little more interesting now so 8 to 9 let's go through and let's take a look and see how many are 8 to 9 no 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 that's one Hey, what else we got here? Now this is an interesting one, nine dollars and eighty-five cents. Now where does nine dollars and eighty-five cents go? That one is between nine and ten, which happens to be the end of one interval and the beginning of another. So we just round. If this this number nine eighty-five, because the eighty-five is more than halfway to ten, that's actually going to go in the ten interval. If this was nine dollars and something less than fifty cents, so nine dollars and forty-five, or nine dollars and thirty-five, or nine dollars and twenty-five, it would go down to the nine count. But since it doesn't, then we're going to keep it and we're going to round it up to the ten count. So we have eight sixty-five. Uh, I'm trying to take a peek here, and I don't see anything else. So we're going to say there's one in the eight to nine. Now we're looking at ten to eleven. In the ten to eleven, again, we got to look at whatever's ten and eleven. So here's eleven seventy. That would be one. 1025 is 2. 985 gets rounded to 10. That would be 3. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to mark 3. Uh, how many things are 12 to 13? Go back up here. 1250 would be 1. Okay, if you want to keep a little track of the tick marks, that's fine too. 12 to 13. So 1, 2, 3, 13.75, that would get rounded to 14, so we're going to leave that alone. And we're looking at 2. Okay, how many things 14 to 15? So 14 to 15. I'm going to switch colors here. 14 to 15, so we're looking at 1, 1480. 1375 is 2. 1410 is 3. And then how many things are 16 to 17? 16 to 17 would be 1640. That's 1. Okay. 1795, that's going to get rounded to 18, so that doesn't count. So 1640 is 1. 16 to 17, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Looks like 2. How many things are 18 to 19? 1, 2. That gets rounded. How many things are 20 to 21? 20. 2175 would get rounded to 22. So 20 to 21, we had 1. We're looking at 2. And then finally 22 to 23. The 2175 is 1. The 2260 is 2. So we're looking at a 1, 3, 2, 3, 2, 2, 2, 2. All right, so let me scroll up here a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so the total is going to be uh, 4, 6, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17. Make sure that matches the data on the top. There's 17, so 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17. So I think I'm, I think I'm pretty good. So this would be 1 out of 17. 3 out of 17, 2 out of 17, 3 out of 17, 2 out of 17, 2 out of 17, 2 out of 17. Okay, and then the class midpoint. Uh, what this, These are pretty simple. What's between 8 and 9, you pretty much know that one. That's going to be 8.5. But if you want to take the 8 and add the 9 and divide by 2, 17 divided by 2 is 8.5. And the increment is 2. So if we add 2, this is going to give me 10 and a half, 12 and a half, 14 and a half, 16. 18 and a half, 20 and a half, and finally 22 and a half. And always make sure that you take a look to the left to make sure that this does look like the middle of an interval. So if this interval is 22 to 23, 22 and a half obviously fits the bill. If you make a mistake and this ends up being a weird number like 30, and you take a look left, you realize 30 can't be in the middle, you know you made a boo-boo. 
All right, so that's the second one. Uh, let's keep going. <clears throat> so here's another example. So here's number three. Uh, let's do a customer service problem. Uh, again, we're trying to do descriptive statistics, get things to make them uh, in a nice and easy to read pretty form. So customer service. The following are the time uh, it took you to wait in minutes on hold until being able to speak by phone to a customer service rep to file a complaint. <laughs> so in filing a complaint, you're still on hold. So I guess that's part of the complaint also. Um, but these are the waiting times. Okay, so we have six minutes that we waited, one and then 11 and etc. We'd like to create a four column to group data table starting your first class with zero and go up in increments of three. So here we go. Again, uh, if you want to pause the video right now, get the answer, that's fine. Uh, and then you can always tune back in later and see if your answer matches my answer. So this is the category column, which is general. This would be wait time, I would think, something like that. We want to start with zero. We want to go up in increments of three. So we're starting with zero. And if we go up in increments of three, then if I add three to zero, that gives me three, and then six, and then nine, and then 12. And looks like the highest that goes 13, that should be fine, because if I um, start with three here, this has to end with two. And then this would be five, add three, add three would be eight, add three would be 11, add three would be 14. Whoops, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, we just want to see now what we got here. So uh, how many are zero to two? One, two for our frequency, three to five. One, two, three, four, six to eight, one, two, three, nope, three, nine to ten, one, two, three for eleven, it was nine to eleven, not nine to ten, and then it looks like one for twelve to fourteen, so that gives me six and nine and ten and thirteen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So if the total is 13, the relative frequencies will be 2 out of 13. Okay. And then the class midpoint. The middle between 0 and 2 you can pretty much figure out is 1. So you can either just put the number 1 or if you want to add the lower number of the interval, the higher number of the interval, divide by 2. 2 over 2 gives me 1. And 3 and 5, the lower and upper divided by 2. 8 divided by 2 gives me 40, well, 4. And you can continue that process if you like, or just simply realize that the increment has to match, so the increment is 3. So if I add 3, it gives me 7, and then 10, and then 13. And those would be our class midpoint. So that would be a full group data table. And again, it's a nice, easy-to-read form. It's a lot prettier to look at than just random digits up here. Now you get a little idea of the wait time. And you notice uh, only one person out of 13 waited quite a bit. Uh, four and seven, and you know the bulk of people were somewhere in the waiting of three to 11. Now, if you showed that to your boss, that would make sense to the boss. You know, this is the wait time, and that that'd be pretty neat. Okay. Uh, so there's another way to do this. Um, the way we did it up here is just a straight to the you know two button. So zero to two, three to five, six to eight. There's another way to do it, which is called the two less than method, and that's what you're going to put. You're going to put the words two less than in between the numbers. So let's let's do a couple two less thans. This is a, this is another option. So let's do a criminal justice question. So uh, the following are uh, length of sentence in years for criminals in Illinois convicted of a felony. So 12 years, 45 years, 50 years. Uh, for a felony. Okay. Uh, for this particular one, um, now in, in the class, what I'm going to do on a test so that you know the difference between the method, which is the straightforward method with the slashes, this is the way I would word a question. Create a four column group data table, and then I would say start your first class with a number. This could change, and the increment, that can change. So if I give you that wording, we're looking for this kind of distribution. The two less than method, I'm actually going to give you the first um, class or interval, and I'm going to word it with the two less than um, words so that you know that this is now the method I want to use. Now, the difference is, is subtle, but it's actually very important because I'll show you. If this is 0 to less than 15, then don't make the mistake of saying, well, then I'm going to start my next 
interval with 16 because then where would 15 go? See, 15 is not less than 15, and if this is 16, it's not even in there. So this is a little different. So 0 to less than 15, you would actually start off then with 15, and then you'd say 2 less than, and now you take a look, and you notice the difference between 0 and 15 is 15. So you want the same difference of 15 here, so you're going to say 15 to less than 30. And then you're going to start with 30. And you can also, if you want, use the less than symbol. Both are done the same. They're both, they both mean the same thing. So 0 to less than 15, 15 less than 30, 30 to less than 45, and 45 to less than 60. I take a peek at my data. I notice I go all the way to 75. So I'm going to have to go 60 to less than 75. And I'm still not quite there because that's less than 75, and I have a 75, and it wouldn't be less than, so you actually have to create another one. And you'd have to go 75 to less than 90. All right, let's get these frequencies down. So how many sentences are 0 to less than 15? 12 would be 1. 15 doesn't count because that's not less than 15. Uh, 0 to less than 15 looks to be just that 1. So the frequency would be 1. How many are 15 to less than 30? 30 wouldn't count because that's not less than 30. Uh, 15, 1. 20 is 2. 25 is 3. 20 is 4. 30 to less than 45. 30 to less than 45. 30 would be 1, and that would be it. 45 to less than 60. 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, I wouldn't count 60 because that's not less than. So now 60 to less than 75. So we're looking at 60 and 70, which would be 2. And then finally 75 to less than 90 would be uh, 1. And I count them up. So we got 5, 6, 10, 12, 13. Total is 13. Let me scoot up a little bit now. Make sure that the data total is 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There we go. And... 1 out of 13, 2 out of 13, 1 out of 13. Now, class midpoint, same basic idea. Uh, 0 to less than 15, a number less than 15 would really be 14.9999999. We're not going to use that, so we're just going to say the lower number of 0. We're actually going to use the 15 instead of like a 14.99999 and divide by 2. So 15 divided by 2, 7.5 for our class midpoint. And then we're going to say 15 and 30, that's 45 over 2, that's 22.5. Okay, notice that our increment is 15, Okay, <clears throat> and that was the increment that we used on the left and the right here. So if we add 15 to this, we're going to get back 37 and a half. 15 to that would be 52 and a half, and 15, 67 and a half, and 15 would be 82 and a half. And so that right there, let me square it up for you. That would be a nice group data table for that um, question about criminal justice and the length of sentences. It's a little more straightforward than just looking at random numbers. And you get a little better idea of where um, four and four are the more people and one and one the less and et cetera. Okay. So let's do another two less then. So I'll take out another sheet here. Uh, advertising. So we want to know the readability levels of magazine ads are reduced the more the number of three syllable or longer words is used in the advertisement. So uh, the following is a list of such words from randomly selected magazine ads. So they're saying that the readability level goes down the harder the words, the words that are, are a little longer in nature. So you want to keep it nice and simple for everybody. All right, so this particular question says uh, we want to create a group data table and we want to start our first interval or class with 1 to less than 8. All right. So again, if you want to pause the video and do the answer, that's great. And then come back and see if you got the answer right, and then I'll show you how it's done. So if this is 1 to less than 8, the next one has to start with 8. And um, the difference, if you notice here, is 7. So the difference here is going to be 7. So 8 to less than 15, and then you start with 15. Uh, you're going to go to 22. Difference is 7 to 8, and then 7 to 15. And let's see, we got a 26. That looks like it's the highest. We have a 31. So we make sure we have to have, oh, I missed that one, 43. So we have to make sure that we have a 43 
our highest number is within these intervals we're creating. So this is going to be 22 to less than 29, 29 to less than 36, 36 to less than 43. So add 777, so we're going to have to go one more, 43 to less than 50. Let me scoot up just a little bit. All right, so how many things are 1 to less than 8? Now, 8's not going to be included, so basically anything 1 through 7. So we're looking at a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5. That one, that one's an interesting one. That one shouldn't even be here. Let's change that number from 0 to 1. <clears throat> I apologize. That shouldn't be 0 since we started with 1. That was silly. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have a 6 and a 7. So we're looking at 7. Numbers are 1 to less than 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, 8 to less than 15. So looking basically anything 8 to 14. So we have 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. 5, 6, 7, 8. Our 8 to less than 15, 15 to less than 22, so we're looking at anything basically 15 to 21, 15 to 21, so we're looking at 1, just 1. 22 to less than 29, looking at 1, 2, anything 29 to less than 36, so 31 would be 1. Taking a quick look, I guess that's the only one. 36 to less than 43, that would be nobody. And then finally 43 to less than 50, that 43 would be included. And we're looking at a total here. We have 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we have on our data 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So the total looks to be good. Okay, so we have 20. So 7 out of 20, 8 out of 20. Again, don't reduce 8 out of 20 um, to either 4 out of 10 or 2 out of 5 because that is not really what's representative of that number. This means 8 people out of 20, and if you reduced it, then you'd be reducing your sample size, and you don't want that. 1 out of 20, 2 out of 20, 1 out of 20, 0 out of 20, 1 out of 20. Okay, class midpoint. The low is 1, the high is 8. That would give me 9 over 2, which is 4.5. And then we can say 8 and 15 divided by 2. That's 23 divided by 2. That's 11.5. Notice the increment here, or the class width, is a 7. And that is over here the difference between 1 and 8 is 7 and 7 and 7 and 7 and 7 and 7, and 7 all the way down. So if we add 7 to 11 and a half, we'd get 18 and a half. Add 7 is 25 and a half. Add 7 is 32 and a half. 39 and a half. Add 7 would be 46 and a half. And that right there, let's square it up for you very nicely. That would be a group data table and we would be using the two less than method. So, so far we've done two methods. We did just the regular method, which I'm going to scoop back over here. The regular method, which was the slashes, worded that particular way. And if I ask you to create a group data table and I give you the first class and it's a less than method, then we use the two less than method. All right, the only thing left, we're almost done. Uh, single value classes. This is, this is an interesting topic where basically the, the class itself only has one value in here. And like, let's say this is a randomly selected grades from a college stats class and um, anything A through F. When we go to do the category, so in this particular case, the category would be like grades. We're just going to say A and B and C and D and F. And then everything kind of flows very nicely like we normally would. How many A's? So we go through and see one and two, two A's. Oh, I wouldn't want to be in that class. <laughs> Well, how many B's? One, two, three. Three B's. We have one, two, three C's. We have one, two, three, four D's. And then we have one, two, three, four F's. And we have a total five, eight, and 8 would be 16. Make sure that matches. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's my 16. 
I would not panic. This was just randomly done by me on the computer. So this is not representative of the grades for this semester. We're hoping to get a lot more A's and a lot more B's. So <laughs> let's not panic. Uh, relative frequency out of 16. So we have 2 out of 16, 3 out of 16. And again, we could change these if we wanted to into uh, decimals and then percentages, but uh, this is fine as far as I'm concerned. All right, now here's really the, the whole thing with um, single value classes. This part is not, you know, this is straightforward like we had before, but see, the problem is the class midpoint, what is the middle of an A? And this is where you can't make assumptions because if you assume, see, this is just a general class. This is not talking about this particular class that I'm teaching, but this is just a general class. We don't know what the A is because it wasn't specifically said. If over here, you know, somewhere in the question they said the A is from this to this, you know, this to this, and, you know, 90 to 100, 80 to 100, 70 to 75 is an A, we could come up with a class midpoint. But that's not stated in the question, so I can't say 95 where the assumption is this is 90 to 100 because we don't know. So there, uh, this would be not applicable. There is no class midpoint because I don't know the middle of these because I really don't know the grading system of the of the course. So that would be not applicable. All right, so here's another one. Let's see if you, you want to do this one. <clears throat> uh, student status. So we have randomly selected status of high school marching band members. Um, so we have, uh, are you a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, or a senior? Sounds good. So we divided it up nicely into freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Uh, the F is freshman, the S is sophomore, the J is junior, and the R is uh, senior so that an S doesn't get confused with an S for sophomore. So we used R for senior. All right, how many freshmen? So how many F's do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six freshmen. How many sophomores? S's. One and two, three, four, five, six sophomores. How many juniors? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five juniors. And then all the rest are seniors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven seniors. All right, so we got 12. This is a total of 24. Uh, make sure that we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. That makes sense. So 6 out of 24, 6 out of 24, 5 out of 24, 7 out of 24. Here's the same basic question. Class midpoint, what is the middle of a freshman? <laughs> well, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, you don't say belly button. That's not the middle of a freshman. <laughs> uh, are you talking about their age? Are you talking about their um, number of hours of sleep? Are you talking about how far away they live from the high school? You have no, We don't know what they're talking about, so we just simply say it's not applicable. We have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so there would be no class midpoint. Unless that's a number over here, we would not have anything to go by to get the middle. All right. So a little summary of what we've done so far. Uh, this, was, this was one that we did earlier. So histograms and polygons. Use, um, we we want to create a histogram and a polygon now from these group data tables. So the first thing you do is group data table. From the group data table, you can create a histogram or a polygon. So um, we did this one earlier. So using the group data tables created for number one and four and six, we want to create a frequency of histogram. And then we want to do a frequency polygon, a relative frequency histogram, and a relative frequency polygon. All right, sounds good. So this was um, number one that we did earlier. I'm just flipping through my notes here. Number one that we did earlier um, <clears throat> with all the answers. All right, so what we want to do. We would like to create uh, frequency hist now histograms and polygons are really the same thing. Let me show you how this works. So if these are all of our ages, okay, and I wanted to create, let me do it right here. See if I can see if I can fit it in here. So if I wanted to do a frequency histogram, now histogram is histogram up here. This is the ones where you have the bars. So bar, bar, bar. That's a histogram. Okay, also called a bar, a bar graph. So if we go 10 to 19, and then 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, etc. Oh, 
080. Okay, 7079. And I want to do frequency. The keyword in there is frequency. So on the left hand side, we want these heights. Uh, the highest height, you notice, is 3. So uh, 1 and 2 and 3. We could go higher if we wanted to. And then basically, we're just going to do bars. So 10 to 19 has a height of 2. So we just make sure that we have a height of 2. 20 to 29 is a height of 1. 30 to 39 is a height of 3. They can either touch or not touch, it doesn't matter. 40 to 49 is a height of 3. Hopefully your bars are a little straighter than mine. 50 to 59 is a height of 2. 60 to 69 is a height of 0, so actually leave that in there. And then 70 to 79 is a height of 1. You don't ever want to, don't, don't go down here and then if there's no 60s, let's say for example, don't go 50 to 59 and then 70 to 79. You don't want to do that. Okay, don't leave that blank. You want to leave it in and actually put in zero because that's the way people want to read them. This would be a frequency histogram. If I wanted to make this a relative frequency, relative frequency histogram, then I would change these left-hand sides instead of frequencies. I would say so this is frequency because that's what I'm using. I would change them to relative frequencies by making them a fraction. But it's a fraction based on uh, the total sample size. In this case, it would be 12. So, for example, 1 has a height of 1. 1 out of 12 is still 1. It's just 1 out of 12. So, if I wanted to do it, you'd have the same exact graph here. It's just you would then have these over here with 12s as you went up. And then you'd have 1 out of 12, 2 out of 12, 3 out of 12, etc. And that's the difference between a relative frequency and a frequency. Frequency would just be the numbers, the 4, the 3, the 2, and the 1. Relative would be the fractions. So, if I wanted to create a frequency polygon, you would start off the same way. You would say 10 to 19, and then your 20s and your 30s. Sixty to sixty-nine, seventy to seventy-nine. Okay, and then again, if you want to do a frequency, then you do the heights. I want to go up to at least three. You can go higher if you wanted to. The only difference now, instead of drawing the entire bar, you would just put a dot at the top of where the bar goes. So, for example, the ten to nineteen is two. So, for ten to nineteen, oops, sorry, ten to nineteen, I would just put a dot there. And then twenty to twenty-nine is a height of one, so I would put a height of one. 30 to 39 is a height of 3, put a dot at 3. The next one is also at 3, 40 to 49. 50 to 59 is 2. 60 to 69 is 0, put a dot at 0. And 70 to 79 is a height of 1. And then you would connect the dots straight as you can. And that would be your polygon. The information you would get is the same, no matter if it's a histogram or a polygon. It's just a matter of which one do you want to use to get out your information. Some are prettier than others. Um, you know, some people like the bar graph, some people like the polygons. It, it just depends on your flavor, that's all. Again, now this is frequency. If I wanted to make them relative frequencies, I would then divide them all by this particular sample size, which happened to be all of 12. So that would be, let me center that for you. Hopefully yours is a little prettier than mine, but basically that's how you do it. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do some examples. This was the answer to number four. And doing the answer to number four, we want to do the same thing. We want to create a relative frequency histogram and also a frequency histogram. So I'm just going to put it over here. We're going to do histograms first. And here I'm going to say this would be 0 to less than 15, 15 to less than 30, 30 to less than 45. And then I want to make sure these heights, the highest frequency I have is 4, so I want to make sure at least I go to 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. You could go higher if you want. It's up to you. And then uh, histograms are the bars, so I want to make sure that this is a height of 1. This is a height of 4. This is a height of 1. This one's a height of 4. This is a height of 2. And this is a height of 1. Okay, so that would be your histogram 
to represent that group data table. So you need the group data table first, and then you can create the histogram. This would be a frequency histogram. If I wanted to create a relative frequency histogram, I would draw the exact same chart, but then I would divide by the sample size. And if you notice, the sample size on these are 13, so these would all be out of 13. 13. And that would be your relative frequency histogram. Now, if I wanted to do a polygon, It's basically the same sketch that you have over here. You're just going to use a dot to represent the height. So again, you'd have 0 to less than 15, 15 to less than 30, and we're going to go all the way up for each interval. Okay, And again on the side, 0, 1, and 2, and 3, and 4. Sorry about that, I didn't make those intervals the best, but uh, then we're going to do dots. So this one is a height of 1, this one's a height of 4, I'm going to put a dot right here. The next one's a height of 1, the next one's a height of 4, uh, then a height of 2, and then a height of 1. And you're going to connect the dots. That would be a frequency polygon. And notice the sample size again is 13, so if I divide by thir 13, I have a relative frequency polygon. So there, center it a little bit. Okay, okay and now let's take a look at <coughs> uh, the answer to number 6. Okay, this was the single value classes. So this is the A through F, and these were the these were the grades, and again, there was no class midpoint. And again, we want to do a uh, histogram. So let's, um, so A and B and C and D and F, and we want a height of at least four. So zero, one, and two, and three, and four. We can go higher if we like. Um, two. B's were three, C's were three, D's were four, and S were four. Okay. We would change these fractions now to sixteenths if we wanted the relative frequency histogram. Okay, that's histogram. Hold it right about there. A, B, C, D, F. We have to go to at least four. Zero, one, two, three, four. And we have two A's, three B's, three C's, four D's, four F's. Straight across, up a little bit, straight across, up a little bit. And that would be your polygon. That would be a frequency polygon because we are using frequencies. They match up to the frequency, and if we choose relative frequencies, we divide by the sample size. Sometimes these can be labeled, again, decimals or percentages. I'm just going to leave them fractions, and uh, you really don't need to know all the rest because you don't need to know when they change them because a lot of times you, you do these with the Excel program. They'll do that for you anyways. So there we go. Uh, lesson number one, and uh, this is the way the basically course is going to work for the rest of the semester. Each particular week has a lesson, and uh, you can pause the lesson in the middle if you get a little bored, or and basically you just you know watch it in your convenience for the whole week. And there you go. So this lesson was descriptive statistics. We did frequency distributions. We did histograms. We did polygons. And uh, okay, uh, do your homework. And I will see you soon for lesson number two. Thank you.